I'll give, I'll give a shout out to Jamie too. Love you. All right. Thankful for her and uh, everything that she does uh, for me and just enables me and, and pushes me and uh, to be a better person. And she's really done that since day one. We started dating. It's, it's, it's a long story that I'll, I'll tell sometime, but uh, you know, I asked her out. We were both single at the same time for the, for the first time that in, the, in the space that we had known each other. And I said, look, you know, let's, let's make it happen. And as soon as she said yes, I, the way I tell the story, I knew we would get married as soon as she said yes to the first date. And, uh, and I knew it would be happy, happily ever after. She said it was, there was a trial period where she was trying to fill me out and see if it would work. But, uh, but she is a, an excellent wife and an amazing mom. And I, so, I appreciate you. Thank you for everything that you do. And that won't be some brownie points a little bit. Cookies when we get home, right? Yeah, she's a good baker too. <laughs> don't, don't let her fool you. Good. All right. That's why I have gained about 100 pounds since we've been married, something like that. And it's only been five years, you guys. All right. So I'm on my way to uh, morbidly obese in a, in a heartbeat. So pray for me. But uh, good. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse number 3. And I appreciate uh, pastor as well. We've been taking on a lot of programs and, and doing a lot of things uh, here at the church, and you see them, uh, you hear the announcements, and you see what's going on. But kind of what cuts through, you know, all of that noise is pastor's heart for people, and that's uh, motivating to me and encouraging for me, and so I appreciate pastor as well. Jeremiah 7, verse number 3, and uh, verse number 4 is where we'll start out, and uh, we'll bounce around a little bit uh, this evening, but we'll read these two verses. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. God, thank you for everyone that is here this evening. And God, I pray that you would uh, just give us a good uh, service tonight. And God, help us to learn something and leave here better Christians, better than we came. In Jesus' name, amen. You'll find a theme, and I, I know that the teenagers that I get to uh, speak to uh, twice a week and, and throughout the week as well, um, uh, there's a theme in a lot of my messages, and that is having a real relationship with God. And I think it's, uh, it, that has become my, my kind of my calling card with, with them especially, is because, you know, for so many, even Christians, and not just people out in the world, you know, God is not real to them. God doesn't, uh, they don't allow God to rule in their life. And so, uh, but having a relationship with God is a possibility for all of us. It's, it, God has made it um, possible for all of us to have that. And so it's become a theme. And uh, so I look for things, and when I'm reading the Bible, I look for things that uh, would motivate me to want to know God more. And that's an easy thing to do. When you read uh, the Bible, God makes himself, uh, he's very transparent and he says, you can know me in, in amazing ways. And so this evening, we're going to take a, a symbol from the Old Testament. And we're going to kind of translate it. And we're going to see how it relates to us in the New Testament church era. The temple is a great picture of our relationship with God. And there's three levels of the temple. There's three main sections of the temple. Okay, can anybody, this is horrible for Facebook, but that's okay. Can anybody tell me one of the, one of the sections of the temple? Anybody in here? The, yeah, the outer court, and what's the other? There's two more. The inner court, and then the third. The Holy of Holies, good. The Holy of Holies. So we'll start with the outer court. Paul wrote in Ephesians about the border of the tabernacle. And uh, in, uh, in the Old Testament times, they, they built up a rock wall separating the uh, outer court from uh, kind of the rest of the world was the symbol there. And they were saying, if you're not an Israelite, if you're not a Jew, you cannot go beyond this wall. And Paul said in Ephesians, take that wall, but... But for, for us, if you are not saved, you cannot enter the temple. So if we are looking at the temple like, uh, like as a picture of our relationship with God, that outer court would be uh, your initial approach to God. It would be salvation. And uh, it's that, that outer court experience. It's that, that moment of salvation when we realize our need for God. And uh, the, um, it starts with all of that even starts with an awareness of our own sin. 
When an Israelite realized his sin and need for forgiveness, he would go to the temple to offer a sacrifice to God. And when you come to, when you come to God, you, it requires a, a self-knowing. It requires you to know who you really are. And you remember the, uh, the Pharisee who prayed uh, in Jesus' time, the, uh, the parable that he gave, where the, the Pharisee was praying to God and he thanked him that he wasn't like uh, this publican, like this sinner. That, that Pharisee was coming to God, he was putting on airs, right? He was pretending that he was something that he wasn't. That's not how we come to God. When we come through the gates of that outer court, the, the gate called beautiful, it's with the intention of yielding ourselves to God and letting Him do work on our heart. That's what we're telling Him. When I come through those gates, I'm ready to repent. And repent is kind of the million dollar word that nobody likes, right? Repent. It's the first word of the gospel, and without it, there is no salvation. With no repentance, there is no salvation. And uh, we often tell the story when we're, when we're uh, explaining how to lead someone to the Lord, or even we're leading someone to the Lord. You know, you have to uh, get them lost before they can be saved, right? If you never have a moment of, uh, of, of uh, a contrite heart and uh, you, repentance before God, you cannot be saved. The Bible makes that very clear. John the Baptist's message was to repent and be baptized. That was his entire, his entire uh, ministry was preaching that message. And the apostles in the book of Acts constantly were telling people, repent, be baptized, and be added to the church. The story of Shimei is a great example of repentance done right. And there's, there's uh, multiple Shimeis in the Old Testament. Uh, one of them was a worship leader for uh, David. And uh, uh, there was an, another one who uh, I uh, believe was a, a companion of Saul as well. And in 2 Samuel chapter 16, Shimei can be found with his family. And they are throwing rocks at King David and his household as they're running from Absalom, David's uh, son. And uh, D uh, David's on, on the run uh, from sure death if he would have stayed near Absalom. And Shimei blamed David for uh, Saul's death. Shimei blamed David for Saul's death. He thought he was, uh, that David was responsible uh, for his death. And uh, so uh, he, Shimei was throwing rocks at David and his household. And the Bible says in 2 Samuel 19, verse number 16, And Shimei, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, which was of Behurim, hasted and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. Verse 18, And there went over a ferry boat to carry over the king's household and to do what he thought good. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was come over Jordan. So uh, just a couple chapters ago, you have Shimei, and he is throwing rocks at David, blaming him for his companion's death. And a couple chapters later, Shimei is ready to repent. And you see there's a couple stages of his repentance. Number one, he fell down before the king. This was a show of humility. Shimei was, uh, was showing the king that he knew his place, that he answers to the king. And we ought to know who we are when we come before our king. And when we come before God with a contrite heart, we humble ourselves to show him that we yield ourselves to him. And in, a, in an act of repentance, we uh, fall down in humility before God. Many of us struggle with this part in particular, when uh, letting God have his place in our heart. Many of us, we like the, uh, the outer, that outer court experience is nice when we come in and it's a, it's a beautiful place and it's amazing. But when we realize that we have to give up some of ourselves to God, that's where we start to hit some sticky ground. And, but Shimei uh, felt it was an act of contrition to fall down before the king. That's the first step of true repentance is to humble yourself. Number two, he recognized who David was. Verse 19, the Bible says, And said unto the king, Let not my Lord impute iniquity unto me, neither do thou remember that which thy servant did perverse to the day that my Lord the king went out of Jerusalem, that the king should take it to his heart. Shimei knew that David had the power to forgive him or to punish him with impunity. 
We ought to live our life in recognition that God is in control. Have you ever tried to operate under your own wisdom? How often do we fail that way? And uh, uh, when, we, when we try to do things the way that we think is best. And I have learned from personal experience that every single time that I try to make life moves without consulting God, it only leads to misery and depression and failure. But every time that I trust God to make a, a, a choice, every single time is a success. Every time, and maybe not, uh, maybe not financially, or maybe not even uh, uh, you know uh, 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 physically, but spiritually is a success when I trust God, when I put my faith in God. We got to give God control over our life to yield ourselves. So number one, uh, Shimei fell down before the king in a show of humility. Number two, Shimei gave David his rightful place in his heart. And number three, he was honest. He was honest. Verse number 20 of 2 Samuel 16, For thy servant doth know that I have sinned. How easy is it for us to make excuses for our shortcomings? Right. We, we like to say, well, I'm not that bad. Look, you know, look at them. I'm not as bad as them. Or we say, uh, you know, maybe uh, it's the last time that I'll ever do that. Right. When we're uh, when we come before God, we tell him, well, look, at, you know, there's all kind of excuses. It's the last time I'll, I'll do it. Or, uh, or, or God help us if we say, you know, God understands my sin, you know, that God does not understand when we wrong him. But real repentance is a coming to grips with who we are. And what we've done. And Shimei did that before David this day. And number four, he put feet to his repentance. The last half of verse 20, the Bible says, Behold, I am come the first this day of all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my Lord, the king. Real repentance shows itself not just in words, but in actions. He took that first step. And the repentance is key to being qualified to enter the, the, enter the temple. You cannot go into the outer court without repenting, without salvation. It cannot happen. But when we, when we walk through the gate, repentance is a motivation to start making moves toward a real relationship with God. And the outer court's a great place, but it's not where we want to stay. If we stay in the outer court, what that means is like we get salvation and, and we think we're good. We get our fire assurance, fire insurance, right? We get assurance of our salvation and we think that uh, we are all set. How many, how many people do you know? How many people have I led to the Lord that that's the furthest that they took their relationship with God, with salvation? How many people? All too often that happens. And it's, it's so unfortunate because that outer court is just the beginning, It's just the beginning of a real uh, relationship with God. So don't stay in that outer court. God has so much for you. After you get through the outer court, you pass through the gates, you've repented. uh, Now you you have the beginnings of a relationship with God. You enter into the inner court. And uh, this is where the animals were brought and people would watch uh, the priest offer, uh, conduct the sacrifice of the animals. And Leviticus 1 through 7 is a captivating passage of scripture. And not really, it's excruciating to read if you try to read it straight through. And, uh, but it gives instructions for uh, the meticulous sacrifice of all kinds of animals. And, uh, and when we talk, sac- we say that word sacrifice, right? For us, that might mean giving up uh, when we give something up. And, but in the context of the Old Testament, sacrifices were bloody and messy and loud. And uh, it, was not a, it was not like a, a normal church service where everyone kind of just, uh, you know, gathered around. It was, it was, it was uh, throats being slid open. It was animals braying. And uh, it, was, it was bloody. Talk about a sensory overload were these sacrifices. And you watch this. You watch all of these, these gory things happen knowing that it was a direct consequence of your own sin. You brought the animal, and you presented it for a sacrifice, and it was because you had messed up. That was why you were there. And uh, there are a few different types of uh, sacrifices that each symbolize something different for us. Number one, you have the burnt offering. This was a very uh, intimate experience. It was between you and the priests and God. And you can find this in the first part of Leviticus 1. 
But the Bible says that the offerer, he would come in with his animal and he'd have his hand on the head of the animal and he would lead it all the way to the altar. The priest would take it and he would burn up the entire animal uh, and, uh, as an offering to God. And uh, this, was the, this was sacrifice in its most pure form. A lot of times when the priest would offer a sacrifice, they would eat the meat afterwards. That would be how uh, the, the Levites would, uh, would get meat is from the sacrifice. But a burnt offering, um, uh, a burnt offering to God was 100%, uh, uh, it was a valuable animal given 100% to God to atone for specific sin. That was the burnt offering. Some of us need to have burnt offerings in our lives. Where we, where we take, maybe there's a specific thing in your life that you're holding on to that you haven't given to God. And you haven't, uh, you haven't made penance for that. You haven't atoned for that sin. Uh, you haven't answered for it to God. And I, I remember when I was a teenager, we would have camp. And it, they would preach all week long, and it was in your face, and it was intense. And they were preaching on specific things and details, and it was, it was all of this. And at the end of the week, they would have a, um, it was like, it was a big bonfire. And uh, they would say, bring, you know, if you were uh, at the girl at, the, at that time, they would say, uh, bring your pants. And you burn your pants, and you say, I'm going to wear skirts for God, right? And, or it would be uh, like uh, CDs of, or tapes, I guess. Not, I didn't really have tapes back in my day, but CDs of, uh, of like rock music and all of this. And I'm, I'm digital only. I don't think I own a CD player. I do. I think in Jamie's car, you have a CD player, right? Is that it? That's it, I think. And so I don't even have a, really a way to play a CD personally and, uh, now. But back then they would say, bring your, uh, your CDs of your rock music and, and your bad music. Bring all the bad stuff in your life that holds you back. Some, you know, uh, these days, I think some of us need to throw our phones in, uh, in that bonfire, in that burnt offering. Some of us need to offer up uh, our computers, say, you know, God, you can have it. Take all of it. I don't want any of it. How, how many of us, and maybe not in this room, but how many of us in the world, our phones just, all they do is hold us back from a relationship with God. All they do is block the waves uh, of our prayers getting to God. And uh, be, just we live in sin. But a, a burnt offering, some of us ought to have a burnt offering in our lives. And we say, God, you can have this. I'm going to give it 100% to you. And I don't I don't even want this at all anymore. That's a burnt offering. Number two, you had a fellowship or a peace offering. This was kind of much, it was very much different from the burnt offering. It was almost a, uh, it was almost a, a, a joyous occasion. It wasn't just a sacrifice, but it was a festive meal. Often the offerer would bring some family and friends and they would each enjoy each other in the presence of God. And this symbolized the fact that the offerer was only able to enjoy this fellowship with God and with a good people because of the blood of a sacrifice that made him holy in the sight of God. And you can find this in Leviticus 4. And thirdly, you had the guilt offering. And this was, much, uh, was, was really more than offering of animals, but it required, cons- uh, excuse me, it required restitution. The guilty person had to confess his sins publicly, offer the blood sacrifice, and make full restitution of what was robbed, adding 20%. This this was the guilt offering. These sacrifices showed the Israelites that they could come to God only with the blood of a worthy substitute. And this inner court was the next step in a real relationship With God. The inner court is a great place to be. If you live in the inner court, that's where you're you're starting to make things right with God, and we're we're trying to become more holy, we're trying to be more like God, and that's the inner court is a great place to be if if, uh, you're a believer, and uh, it's wonderful. But the the place that I want to be in my life is the holy place, the holiest. A lot of people call it the holy of holies. I, I couldn't find that in the Bible. And, uh, you know, I heard about it a lot in Bible college. They talked about the temple, but I guess they, they would call it the Holy of Holies. Uh, but I guess I learned a lot of things in Bible college I never found in the Bible, right? And uh, so, uh, but in the Bible, you can find it called the holiest, the holy place. And uh, this is the innermost and most sacred part of the whole temple. 
And once a year, the priest is called the, uh, the Day of Atonement. The high priest would go into the holiest and atone for his sins and the sins of the people. And he would burn incense and sprinkle the blood of a sacrificed animal onto the mercy seat. And the holiest was separated from the rest of the temple by a, a thick, uh, heavy veil. And it was, it was massive. It, you know, you couldn't uh, you really couldn't probably move it with, with uh, one person, but uh, it, it separated the people from the, the, the actual presence of God. God would literally come down in the holiest and uh, meet with the high priest there. And so now, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, right, the, one of the amazing things that happened on the cross, is one of many, when Jesus died, when he gave up the ghost, uh, the Bible says that that veil separating the people from the holy place, from the presence of God, that veil was torn in two. And now we can enter into the holiest and uh, commune with God. We can have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of the last worthy sacrifice we'll ever need. We don't need a high priest to atone uh, for our sins anymore, but we've been inducted into the royal priesthood. And, uh, and we answer only to Jesus, the great high priest. Hebrews 10.10, 10, the Bible says, by the, which will, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So we no longer have to make sacrifices in the inner court. And we no longer have to uh, sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. It's already been applied. And Jesus was the last, uh, the last sacrifice we would ever need. He alone was worthy to die for the sins of mankind. And thank God that he was willing to do that for you and me. The temple symbolized what we can have now. A personal relationship with God. When we enter the uh, outer court upon salvation, we've repented of our sins, and uh, we not, now we abide in God, right? We, uh, that's the initial uh, inter interaction with God, is that outer court. And then we go move into the inner court, where God says, look, this is where uh, you start to make things right, and you get to know me really well. And we have a real relationship. But that holiest that place, the, ho the holy place, the holy of holies, whatever you want to call it, that was the place where real business was done with God. The priests communed with God face to face and in His presence. And uh, it's, it's amazing. The, the stories about uh, the Holy of Holies, the priest would wear uh, a rope around his ankle and a bell. And when he, before he went in, he had to shave his entire body, had to take, he had to uh, wash his entire body head to toe. And before he could go in, he would sacrifice the animal and uh, make sure everything was right. He would confess all of his sins and wouldn't hide anything from God before he would go into the holiest, uh, the holiest of places. And, and you know, there's stories about when the priests would go in and, and they would have a, a hidden sin or unconfessed sin. And uh, the, the presence of God would overwhelm them even to death. And uh, they would have to drag them out by that rope. They couldn't, they couldn't even go in to get his body. They had to drag him out uh, by that rope. That was how holy God was. And so this uh, holy of holies, for us, that's not a place probably that most of us live. That's what, we are, uh, that's what we are attaining to. I want to get there in my life. I, I can think of maybe one time or twice in my life where, um, where I really knew that, uh, you know, that, 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 that I had the power of God in an in a, in a, in a amazing way on my life. I can think of a couple times in my life, and maybe you have more, and it's, it's totally possible that that's the case. But I want to get there. I'm, I want to work every day to get where I'm in the place that God can really give me everything, where I can be in His presence. So we ought to strive to get to uh, that, that holy of holies. And maybe you say this evening, oh, man, I'm in the outer court. I haven't even started to make steps toward uh, the holy of holies. But I've, uh, I've gotten my salvation and I'm all set and I'm, I'm okay. Don't, let, don't settle for the outer court. Work your way in to the inner court and the Holy of Holies where you can know God, where you can know His presence. And what an amazing thing that is. 
that a God like him would let us know him. How amazing that is. Uh, scum like me and, uh, and worthless and corrupt creature as I am. God says, I, I'm giving you the opportunity to know who I am and to, and to have a real relationship with us. Because if we don't have that, what is any of this worth? Uh, what, is, what is this building worth? What is our program's worth? If we, don't, uh, if we don't push to have a relationship with God, how is your walk with God? Are you stuck in the outer court or are you in the inner court and you're giving things to God even in the holy of holies? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this lesson that we learned from the temple this evening. God, that we can know you, that we can ab abide in the holy of holies. And uh, that you would uh, give us a relationship with you. What an amazing thing that is. Thank you so much. I pray that you would motivate us to work every day uh, to be in your presence. Thank you so much for everything you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen.